Now, the uh, agent bit. Um, Fakra is looking for an agent. That's all you need to know. My first task was to find a publisher and I posted some carefully selected samples of my work to Faber and Faber. What followed gave me an insight into the world of publishing which suggested that I might experience difficulties in getting my genius recognised. Faber, it appeared, liked my work. Faber didn't. <laughs> so he goes into the agent. Uh, um, Well, I said, what do you think? He backed away slightly, cowed perhaps by my penetrating gaze. What can I say, he said. I have no idea. This, it need hardly be said, was an untruth. He could obviously have said that I had written a work of genius and that he had spent the morning alerting the publishing world to the brightest star in the artistic firmament. Modesty of the face of my gifts is, however, one of my less attractive flaws. I held my peace. He seemed agitated and began surreptitiously fingering the contents of his waste bin. Without doubt a sick man, but that was his problem. <laughs> McFeeck, he mumbled. McFeeck. He seemed to be searching for the opposite phrase, so I leaned across the desk to spur him on. I presume, I said, you saw what I was trying to do. Trying, he said, I started by my forthright manner. Uh, trying, more than trying, McFeeck. You've succeeded triumphantly. Having said that, you don't think it's too dense? He waved my question away. On the contrary, what I said, not dense enough. I knew damned well it was dense enough, but I was testing him. Why choose the wrong agent when I could have my pick? No, no, he said, fearful of losing a prospective client of no small prestige. Uh, spot on in the density department. Perfectly dense. <laughs> Not to mention, he seemed unnecessarily psychophantic at this point, but I could take it. Densely perfect. I sprang to my feet. I'm delighted to hear you say it. It's just that 14 different symbolic levels can tend to overwhelm the first-time reader. 14, he said. 20 at least. Possibly more. Who can tell? I chortled wryly and made some witty remark about the artist not fully understanding his own work. <laughs> he sighed dramatically and lamented the fact that he had a full roster at the moment, that he wished one of his clients would die, and that his secretary would see me out. I chose to ignore this. I gave him the hard McFeeck stare, almost a glare to some ways of thinking, but a look that pierces at any rate soul to soul. And which, I asked, was your favourite piece? He looked suitably alarmed at the magnitude of the question, but gave an answer <laughs> after an interminable pause, which pleased me greatly. I can honestly say, he said, that they all stand, at present, absolutely equal in my eye. I could work with this man. <laughs> I am delighted by your answer, I averred, thumping the table that now stood between us, but we must sacrifice one to the press, strictly for publicity purposes, you know the sort of thing, one of those boxed items in the obscure hinterland of Saturday's Irish Times, a message to the reading public, le nouveau McFeeck est arrivé. <laughs> I paused. Which one? He leaned across the table. To be brutally honest, McFeeck, he said, your work is so deep, so resonant, operating as it does on such a multiplicity of levels that you cannot possibly expect to be published in your own lifetime. <laughs> he marched to the door. I am humbled by your genius. He opened the door with a flourish. You write for future generations, McVeigh. Make no bones about that. For one in his exalted position to recognize the claims of posterity on my work is beyond high praise. I left his office in a state of euphoria, his parting words resounding in my joyful ears as I feigned nonchalance and strutted gaily to the exit. Come back in 200 years, McFeeck! <laughs> he thundered. We'll clean up! <laughs>